Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming today to celebrate the YPI final presentations at Crestwood Preparatory College. My name is Carrie Ann Engelbert. I'm Simran Anam. And I'm Evan Prosterman. We will be your hosts for this year's YPI ceremony. We were last year's winners and we presented on behalf of the Women's Abuse Council of Toronto. Land recognition is a tradition of showing appreciation and respect that goes back centuries in many Indigenous cultures. Today, it is an act of reconciliation that reminds us of our relationship to the land where we live, work, and learn, and asks us to consider how we are honoring and upholding the rights of Indigenous people. Crestwood lies on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat people. Today, this territory remains home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit and the Williams Treaties, signed with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. This artwork is by Métis artist Christy Belcourt. It is called Our Lives Are in the Land. In her artist statement, Belcourt says, the plants are teachers. They are connected to each other and are all other spiritual beings through the sacredness of life. When I remember who I am, a human being connected to all of life, I remember also that I am loved by the spirit world and our ancestors. And when I remember this, I remember to respect even the smallest of things. I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome all those watching, either at school or at home. We would also like to thank members of YPI and our judges, Kian Torabi, Gabrielle Porgan, J. Lou, Mr. Joel, and Mr. Tyndall for their help in helping us to determine this year's winner. This year's YPI is a little closer to normal. Although we are not back in the gymnasium as an entire school, we are having a more normal finals presentation with the judges being able to watch this year's final in person. We look forward to hopefully getting back to an in-person presentation next year. This year's presentations are Juliet's Place, Covenant House Toronto, and Layup. We will watch the three presentations, follow up with some closing remarks, and then present this year's winner. For the past 20 years, YPI has worked with hundreds of secondary schools, charities, and funding partners across Canada to shift real grant-making power to young people and to give them an authentic platform to speak up about the issues and services that matter to them in their own communities. YPI is a program where young people, teachers, charity professionals, and fun funders, workers, together to provide funding to local charities to support, to show our support and solidarity with equity seeking people and to contribute to the conditions for systematic social change through deep youth led research and advocacy, greater public awareness and support and through more connected and compassionate communities. Every year, grade nine and 10 students participate in YPI in their schools and communities all across Canada, the United Kingdom and New York City. In Canada, more than 12,000 students are participating in YPI this year. Along with the presenters we will see today and all of our school's grade 10s who participated in their classes this year, students will deliver thousands of presentations about charities that are helping their own communities and teach thousands of people about social issues and solutions that matter. Thank you. Thanks to your work, YPI will award almost half a million dollars to charities chosen by students across Canada. YPI was an opportunity for this year's grade 10 students to learn about the different social issues people are facing in our community and about the valuable work charities are, are doing to address these issues. Students have shared what they learned through creative projects, and today we will hear from the top groups across the grade level. This year, we recognize that there are limited extracurricular activities and ways to get involved and help your community. But to all of the YPI students, you should be really proud of what you've accomplished and contributed through YPI. You can and should leverage your contributions in order to continue your journey as an active citizen in school and beyond. YPI is an experience that thousands of students have shared about in scholarship applications and Lauren scholarships and TD scholarships for community leadership are two of the biggest ones in Canada that support students who demonstrate exceptional initiative in making a difference in their community. 
you will be eligible in grade 12 and can share about experiences throughout your high school career. Getting or staying involved with your YPI charities would contribute to a great application. Today, we're going to watch the top presentations from each year, from the year. Congratulations teams on making it to the YPI final. I know we're all gonna learn to learn, to learn from you today. After the presentations, we will have a couple closing remarks and the winner, winning group will be awarded a $5,000 grant for their charity. Please join me in welcoming today's presentators. The first group presenting will be Jaden Clements, Karina Philippica, Olivia Cormier, and Ali Sohn about Juliet's Place. Hi, I'm Karina. I'm Jaden. I'm Ali. And I'm Olivia. And today, we are going to be talking about Juliet's Place. Shouldn't every woman have a safe place to sleep at night? We'd like to begin by giving you a definition for domestic violence and abuse. The United Nations defines domestic abuse as a pattern of behavior in any relationship that is used to gain or maintain power and control over their partner. Abuse can involve physical, sexual, emotional, economic, or psychological actions or threats that can influence another person. This includes behaviors such as intimidating, manipulating, hurting, or humiliating another person. Domestic violence and abuse can happen to everyone. There is a stigma attached that makes people assume that wealthier people don't suffer from domestic violence and abuse. However, this is false. People of any race, age, sexual orientation, religion, gender, socioeconomic background, or education level can be subjected to abuse. People suffering from domestic violence or abuse may fear that people will judge them or treat them differently once their experience is known. Education about the cycle of abuse and the reason it's difficult to prevent and escape abuse can decrease stigma and shame. Violence and abuse has a severe impact on people and the community. In regards to children, short-term consequences of abuse can include fear, worry, guilt, shame, and low self-confidence. They can also suffer from nightmares or sleeping difficulties and withdraw socially. Abuse can greatly impact individuals, families, and sometimes the whole community, as the abuser can force the victim to cut contact from their family and friends. This forces the victim to suffer alone. Relational abuse has a negative impact on individual health, causing symptoms of anxiety, depression, eating disorders, disturbances to sleep, and physical pain such as chronic stomach aches. It can also negatively affect the victim's social, academic, and professional life. COVID-19 has caused an increase in abuse. As a result of the lockdowns and the virus making it much more difficult for women and children to leave from these harmful situations. They are isolated from their friends, families, and resources that can help them escape. Julia's Place is an emergency shelter for women and their children located in Scarborough. The shelter provides a three-month stay before helping the women find longer-term shelter or a house of their own. Juliet's Place has 12 bedrooms and five washrooms, recreation room, a kitchen, laundry facility, an outdoor playground with a basketball court. Juliet's Place helps women to become more confident in themselves and begin to recover from their abuse. They can aid women in working towards getting a degree. For example, some women have gone on to become lawyers and doctors. Juliet's Place sets itself apart from other emergency shelters because they accept boys to accompany their mothers up to the age of 18. After they pass 18, an advocate assesses the need for them to stay together. A story from one of the advocates was that a woman's husband wasn't physically abusive, but the husband would tell his son that if his mom didn't listen to him, he would hurt her. When the mom and her sons fled to the shelter, the boy felt that he had to protect his mom and his brother, that he had to be his mom's guardian. 
An advocate worked with him in different programs and outings to teach him that he could relax and that he doesn't have to protect his mom and brother anymore. Juliet's place is located on Tapscott Road with the main intersection being Nielsen and Finch. It is near many essential establishments such as Life Labs, a no frills and a shopper's drug mart. Julia's place is the only shelter in the northeast part of Scarborough and is located in the heart of the community. The initial purpose of the design of the shelter was so that people wouldn't try to question or find more information about the shelter or for the abuser to easily locate their partner. 30 years ago, there were no shelters in the area. The city strategically put shelters in certain parts of the city so it can support the demographic. However, there's a limit to how close a victim can be to the location of Juliet's place. This is for safety reasons, so the abuser doesn't find the woman or put the staff at risk. Homeward Family Shelter, Juliet's Place, stands as a beacon of hope and refuge for abused women and their children. Juliet's Place was established in June 1990. It was a nonprofit collective to provide emergency shelter and other support services for abused women and children, as well as homeless families in Scarborough. It was a 35 bed establishment that was built solely to provide shelter. The organization's focus was changed shortly after its founding to concentrate on rescuing abused women and children. Homeward Family Shelter was given the legal authority to operate as Juliet's Place in 1997 in honor of former resident Juliet Reynolds, who was murdered by her estranged partner and abuser on Mother's Day in 1996. Juliet's Place has been a safe haven, helping thousands of women and children who passed through their doors for over 30 years. Juliet's Place has a team of about 15 full-time employees and 18 part-time employees currently working at the shelter. In the past, Juliet's Place has had a plethora of volunteers helping out. Sadly, due to COVID, not as many people are currently able to volunteer. Shelter workers try to maintain the safety of families and create a safety plan. They maintain confidentiality so that people looking for them cannot find out whether or not they are staying at the shelter in case this could lead to the abuser of finding them. Long-term long impacts that result from the charity's work are advocacy for women, connections with other social service agencies and transferring clients between different agencies. The work at Juliet's Place has a great impact because they're helping people learn what gender-based abuse looks like because for a long time, it hasn't been acknowledged. They advocate for change and teach what needs to be done better so that there's more awareness, funding, and support. They chose Juliet's Place because they feel the organization is making a big difference in the community. They're impacting women and changing their lives every day. Julia's Place gives women and children the ability to feel safe after leaving and to learn how to survive and thrive in the world. We met with Alana, a woman's advocate from Juliet's Place. She's been working at Juliet's Place since 2019. She talked to us about what she does and about how Juliet's Place helps women who are recovering from their experiences. She told us that she does multiple jobs, such as taking crisis calls, screening the women and their children, taking their ID, identifying their abuser, making a record of any injuries or scars, and many more things. It was really inspiring talking with Alana and learning more about what Juliet's Place does to help protect these women every day. Juliet's Place has many generous supporters and donors, including the Keg and Ripley's Aquarium. These contributions benefit not only the charity, but also the people who live at Juliet's Place. For example, Ripley's Aquarium donated four tickets, allowing a child to go to the aquarium for his birthday. Juliet's Place makes its revenue from a, different, a few different sources. The majority of their funding is from the government, which makes up over 90% of their budget. Juliet's Place also receives about 6.6% .6 of their funding from donations. The remainder of their funding comes from other sources of revenue. Funds are used for different expenses, but 93.3% of their revenue is for their char charitable programs. Management and administration takes up 5.75% of their revenue, and fundraising takes up about 0.0% .0 of their funds.
Learning about Juliet's place was an eye-opening experience. We are truly grateful to have the privilege to be educated about what these women and their children go through and what is needed to help them. It was an honor to learn more about Juliet's place and the charity from Alana. We are thankful that Juliet's place is saving the lives of women and children who are subjected to abuse every day. The $5,000 grant would be extremely helpful for Juliet's place. Juliet's place is a nonprofit shelter and parts of the shelter are funded by the Ministry of Community and Social Services. The government pays for things such as food, utilities, and electricity. However, many programs aren't funded by the government, and Juliet's Place needs to find money to be able to provide them. For example, taking kids mini-putting, going to the zoo, swimming, and much more. This grant would ensure that these programs are not at risk of being shut down and can instead be expanded upon to help even more women and their children. You can contact Juliet's Place here using their QR code or their emergency helpline or visiting the website or email. Just remember, you are never alone. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your presentation, Jaden, Karina, Olivia, and Ali. We will now have Adriana Elanidis, Denzel Bafuli, and Aiden Vo make their presentation about Covenant House Toronto. This is our YPI project on Covenant House. Adriana. And Aiden. Amy grew up in a middle-class family with abusive parents who forced her to do gymnastics and two older sisters who ignored her. She never felt like she was good enough to her parents to chart her self-confidence. She had a hard time making friends and hated the way her body looked. When she turned 12, she developed an eating disorder and started to self-harm. After being in an abusive relationship with an older person, she found Ryan. He was charming and confident, and before she knew it, she was in love with him. She started dating Ryan, and not after long, she found out that he had a lot of money problems and was in debt. She was loaning him a lot of money, but that didn't seem to solve the problem. After a little while, Ryan introduced her to his friend, who works at a massage parlor and has sex for money. He convinced her to work there, and she agreed, being blinded by love. She started to work 12 hours a day, eight to nine clients a day, and would often come home exhausted while Ryan would stay home smoking weed. She explained to him that she did not want to keep working like this and wanted to stop. He was furious and said that he did not want to be with a girl who does not bring him money. Scared of losing him, Amy continued to work. One day when Ryan was not home, she started taking a lot of drugs and felt suicidal. All she had hoped for was that if she kept working like this a little longer, things would change for the better. Not long after that, they moved to a high-end condo in Toronto, which she was paying the rent for. One night, Ryan came home and she started yelling at him while being drunk. All of her frustration started to come out. He beat her until she was unconscious. The morning after, she woke up hearing Ryan and his friends discussing killing her and hiding her body up north where nobody could find her. She, found, or she made plans to escape. She found an apartment miles away from the condo and took all of her belongings into a cab and left. She never heard of Ryan again, seeking help from Covenant House. She received counseling for her physical and mental health and learned that she was a victim of sex trafficking. She moved to a different city and returned to post-secondary studies and started a new life. This is one of the many stories that Covenant House has helped people with. Now, some people may wonder what sex trafficking is. Sex trafficking is mainly human trafficking for the purpose of sexual exploitation. Many people call it modern slavery because the victims are forced into sexual acts. 97% of victims of sex trafficking are women and girls. And what is youth homelessness? Youth homelessness is a condition where you are lacking a stable and a safe housing place for young people. Over 50% of homeless youth are results of abuse at home, and up to 40,000 Canadians experience homelessness every year. 42% of youth 
were reported to have almost committed suicide. And 82% of homeless youth experience a large amount of distress in relation to mental health. Now, where does Covenant House come in all of this? Covenant House is a large privately funded agency that provides food, shelter, immediate crisis care, and many other services to homeless and runaway youths. The organization mainly targets youths from 14 to 20 and supports them to become independent adults. It all started in 1982 when Cardinal Carter found kids outside of the office, which was located downtown. He rallied the communities to support Covenant House to serve the vulnerable youth. The doors officially opened in February 1982 and later opening on-site high school in 1988. In 2011, they launched a culinary arts program called Cooking for Life. And in 2016, this part is not on the timeline, they launched a hotel industry program to spot and report trafficking in any hotels. Covenant House Toronto is, is located downtown Toronto. It's open 24 seven and accepts anyone who is in need of help. Covenant House has an average of 280 youths of which they support every day. They serve 2,500 nursing youths each week and they have over 4,000 annual visits to their on-site health center. Like I said before, they provide 24-7 support all year round. So our drop-in center is open seven days a week, and we offer housing support, one-to-one -one counseling, laundry, internet services, food and clothing bank, and shower. I like the fact that we offer immediacy right away to youth that come in and show their respect and love to youth each day. The healthcare clinic provides barrier-free healthcare services to youth experiencing homelessness and survivors of sex trafficking. One of the really unique things about our clinic is that we don't require ID or health coverage. Our healthcare team of nurses, doctors, and psychiatrists creates a environment and atmosphere that is warm and inviting to all the youth who access our services. A youth crisis shelter is a space that's available to any youth age 16 to 24. We allow for a safe space for the youth coming in off the street that don't have anywhere else to go. If you think about a living room in your own house, when you have a group of people in that atmosphere and in that room, you can't help but to maybe let those walls down a little bit and through organic conversations, just begin to trust and be able to trust the process that staff are here to help. Staff are here to meet those needs that you have. Other youth are here to connect with you. And I think that's the magic of the Great Hall. One of the first things we ask a young person when they arrive to Covenant House seeking our support is, are you hungry? When a young person doesn't know when their next meal is going to be, it provides a lot of anxiety and it's also a financial burden for them. Therefore, when we provide three structured meals a day at a scheduled time for them, and it's healthy and nutritious, and allows them to focus on other things, finding housing, finding a job, going back to school. The sanctuary embraces all spiritual, religious, and cultural backgrounds. It serves to nourish the spirit through prayer, meditation, mindfulness, awareness, yoga, sacred readings, and silence and solitude. Recognizing the spiritual dimension of the youth helps them in the process of meaning making, building a framework of hope and strength, and awakening and nurturing the sense that each and every one of them is precious and worthy of peace, love, and joy, and healing in their life. I meet youth where they are, and I seek to support and nurture them in the process of healing. The Rites of Passage program is Covenant House's on-site, longer-term transitional housing program for 28 youth between the ages of 16 to 24. The youth here work on their mental health, education, and employment goals. The school really takes pride in supporting our youth, meeting their academic goals at their own pace. Part of that support is providing those important social skills that allows them to have personal growth and move on to be independent human beings when they leave our school program. We try to equip youth with different skills that will help them in their job search process, whether it's even just looking for a job or how to write their resume. Then once they obtain jobs and connect with employers, we want to make sure that they know that our job isn't done, that we want to continue to make ourselves available to whatever needs that may have to continue to support them. As you can see, 
they have a beautiful facility. You can help Covenant House, and here's how. We encourage anyone who wants to volunteer. And there are many different ways you can do that, like sorting donations, mentoring the people that live there, and helping host fundraisers and events. You can also donate items to them that they will distribute to the youth at Christmas. They take Presco cards, store cards like Shoppers, Winners, and Indigo, and fast food gift cards like Subway, Harvey's, and Starbucks. Is there a website if they can get a hold of? Thank you for listening. Thank you for your presentation, Adriana, Denzel, and Aiden. Our final presentation will be about Layup by Marco Billick, Sadie Hotless, and Jenna Smelling. Hi, I'm Jenna. I'm Sadie. I'm Marco. And today we'll be doing our YPI project on layup. Who here has had the ability to be part of an out of school sports team or extracurricular activity? Raise your hand. As seen by the amount of hands raised proves that how privileged we are to be born into households that can provide for us and have enough income to support a child towards a happy and fulfilling life. The layup charity is able to be a source of happiness to many children who aren't as privileged as us and who can't play a sport or join a club due to their family's low income. History of layup and who founded layup. Layup was founded by Max Davio in 2013, and it has been providing a free leadership based basketball program for boys and girls around the age 14 in Toronto. Can all team cast members that they have not already come to turn on their costumes please come down to 108? All two cast members, also those missing female characters. We are looking for you. Please come to room 108, Miss Scarlet, Miss White. He started. He started this, this charity in need to help and need to help kids and teenagers be able to be active and play sports when they can't afford it. The goal is to offer opportunities to kids regardless of financial means, gender, skill, gen or background. The program wants to help develop the skills and confidence children and youth need to navigate their future. I played basketball as a kid, said Davio, found of, founder of Layup of Youth Basketball. At the time, it was just about fun. But as I look back on it, I developed so many life skills like leadership, teamwork, communications, not to mention all of the friends he made. The locations that this charity provides help to are, are all very low income areas. All of these locations have very high poverty rates and often youth in these areas get involved in gangs and criminal behavior. For example, Malvern and Rexdale have high crime for youth as Malvern alone had 67 crimes per 1,000 young adults in the past year. These communities need programs such as Layup to keep children off the streets and out of trouble. Layup values the lives of children. Marco, Sadie, and I are all athletes and are all tired of seeing people in the sports succeed only because of the amount of money their families come from. Everyone should have a fair chance to showcase their talents without a price being involved. The society we live in puts a hierarchy on young athletes' accomplishments on money rather than a person's ability. Given the chance and opportunity, many of these kids living in low-income families could become amazing athletes. Layup gives kids the equal opportunity to reach their dreams, like going to the NBA. Everything is free as they don't expect money from kids who come from low-income communities. Child poverty is an issue that takes place in all parts of the world. No child should have to live their childhood surviving off of each meal and not receiving opportunities that other children do. Around 1.3 million children in Canada live in child poverty, and the effects of this are not limited. Some short-term effects of child poverty include increased risk of malnutrition, obesity due to food insecurity, short-term health problems, etc. Some long-term effects include not enough financial resources to rely on in times of crisis, mental health problems, chronic diseases, and many more. 
Due to this, these children don't have access to resources that other children have the privilege to, such as participation in sports. Partic participation in sports is so crucial at a young age, not only for enjoyment, but also for the mental health of children. Layup offers a number of different programs throughout their initiative that fits any criteria. Over the course of building their campaign, they have added many new programs. They provide access to any kids aged 6 to 19 for all of their programs. These include an all-girls program, which is run by female coaches, a co-ed program involving co-ed coaches, and summer day camps, which take place every day for four weeks. Camps within the initiative are available all year round. Co-ed and female programs are run throughout the whole year, whereas the summer day camps are just provided throughout the summer. Their programs are available to any child, children of any skill set, and they do not require any form of basketball experience. We would like to spend the 5000 on charitable activities and programs because that is where Layup spends most of their money. The money would help them set up more activities and camps for the kids and teenagers who want to play basketball in Toronto. As seen on the chart, Layup expenses mostly consist of charitable activities and programs in management and administration. With the $5,000, Layup will even be able to provide for more low-income locations and make more programs available to kids of various skill levels. Layup had about 500 kids participating during this school year, October to April. Even more kids participate in summer day camps, which are every day for four weeks. Layup is a home away from low income, racism, sexism, and food access. These kids come to Layup and are able to feel a part of a community, a family where all of their issues can be taken out on the sport and they're able to surround themselves with people who can support them. When kids are involved in layup, they're able to stay off the streets and away from getting in trouble. Often low-income families work shift work and late nights, but this program allows parents to be free of stress knowing that their kids are busy, safe, and playing a sport they love. Layup not only helps the child, they help the families and everyone else involved in the community as well. The coaches and volunteers at Layup are all provided with care and are treated in the best way possible. All of the coaches within Layup are paid for their hours. However, there are more people who decide to volunteer rather than coach. Volunteering within the initiative is something that Layup is passionate about and promotes. Not only do the coaches within each program get paid, but they also receive CPR and first aid, which certifies them for future jobs they may apply to. There are a number of coaches within each program, including head and assistant coaches that take pride in what they do to make sure that the experience is as enjoyable and as inclusive for each child. Layup provides resources such as Nike jerseys, sports bras for girls, snacks, and lunches. Kids also have $0 costs for transportation because the communities are within walking distance. When COVID-19 hit and everyone was in quarantine, kids who didn't have a laptop to do workouts with would be given one. Layup gave out 50 last year alone. Layup has a lot of supporters, partners, and people who fund their charity. Most of their supporters and some people who fund are listed down below. Some of the main supporters include Nike, Ontario Trillium Foundation, and the Owen Foundation. Other contributors include John David and Signe Eden Foundation family, Point North Capital, and Aaron Barbarian. The funds that Layup receives are put towards different things. The main source for the distribution of Layup's funds goes towards resources. These resources include things like jerseys for each child, sports bras for girls, snacks, and lunches. These are all necessary things that people may not think about. Each program needs more and more of each for everyone, so it is crucial that there are funds supporting these. Another chunk of the funds Layup receives goes towards future programming and venues for events. Like I said, each coach involved within Layup gets paid. Even though there are volunteers, there are still a number of coaches who receive pay, and this is where some of the funds go towards. At Layup, youth develop the skills they need to succeed on and off the court. This quote found on the Layup Youth Basketball Twitter promotes the importance of program for youth, not only for the sport, but for everyday life. The mission of Layup Youth Basketball is to empower young people with the confidence and life skills they need to be community leaders of tomorrow. Layup is a registered charity that provides cost-free leadership basketball programs throughout priority communities in Toronto. Absolute Access is about providing a free program, but also 
about addressing other barriers kids face, like skill levels, gender, background, and really providing an offering that's open to all. A part of all layup programs is dedicated towards the off-court development of our participants and focuses on academics, life skills development, healthy living, and community citizenship. Layup's programs aren't only cost-free, but they provide a true equal opportunity and every participant receives a jersey, lunch, snacks, water bottle, medals, and other prizes. At Layup, we focus on truly connecting and understanding needs in each of our neighborhoods and even provide paid jobs to former participants and other young adults in the neighborhood. I was at their position once and seeing them smile and actually being happy that they're there is truly blessed and it makes me want to smile every day. The energy of Layup is really like nice. Everyone's like hyped to play and you know, I just really liked it here. At Layup, we pride ourselves on providing year-round programming for our participants, including summer camps as well as school year programs. I love Layup because you get to express yourself and learn what you want to learn. Like the kids are like the main reason why I actually became a coach, just having like a great impact on them, being a, a role model to some of the kids. I still see them, and some of the kids actually come up to me while I'm at the community center and ask for help to just improve on their skills. I would recommend live to other kids because it's like a great way for the community to come together and like play some basketball. Winning is not the most important thing in life. It's always trying your hardest. At Layup, we believe that every kid needs a team. Teamwork by three. One, two, three. As seen in the video, Layup isn't just a charity. It is a place that children can call home. A place where equality is presented in true form and where the sport of basketball brings out the best in everyone. That's it for our presentation. Thanks for listening. Wow, those were some incredible presentations. Let's have another round of applause for all the teams. Thank you, finalists. We applaud you for rising to this important challenge. It takes courage to stand up for something you believe in. Today is about our community. It is about understanding the real social issues that people are facing every day and about learning the vital role of local charities and the services they provide. It's also about reflecting on our part in making our communities more compassionate and caring places for everyone to live. The judges will now take a few minutes to deliberate and decide on this year's winner. We will be right back. Today is also about recognizing and showing our gratitude for the efforts of all the educators, students, families, and charities who brought YPI to life this year for your school and community. I would especially like to thank Mr. Volk, Mr. Smith, all of Crestwood's administration, and our judging panel. We would also like to thank Mr. David for all of his support of YPI. And to all of the grade 10 students who worked so hard on YPI in their classrooms and community this year, through your effort and your presentations, you have set an example to each other about how to meaningfully and critically engage with the issues around you. Special thanks to YPI supporters for making the program possible this year at our school. Every YPI team teaches an average of 50 new people about a social issue and local charity. What you have all done this year is an accomplishment and we are grateful for your efforts to make our community a more compassionate place. I urge you all to stay involved with your charities you have represented in YPI. Keep raising awareness, keep breaking stigma, keep challenging yourself, and keep volunteering in ways that are meaningful to you and your community. And now, without further ado, I would like to announce the winner of the $5,000 YPI grant, Jaden, Karina, Olivia, and Ali of Juliet's Place. Thank you to everyone who participated and congratulations to our 2022 YPI winners.